Rocket Lab's Neutron goes pop, China reveals its solar system exploration plans, and we have the answer to what went wrong with Russia's Luna 25. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 6th of October, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Rocket Lab has completed cryogenic testing of its Neutron Upper Stage test tank, and it ended with a bang. If you've been around this channel for a while, you probably know how frequently SpaceX tests tanks to the point of destruction at Starbase, especially when they test things like new materials or new tank designs, things like that. Well, Rocket Lab did just that with its Neutron Upper Stage test article. The company reported that the teams have completed the cryogenic testing for the test stage, but they didn't give a lot of details about things like how many cryogenic tests were performed or how long the tests were. But they did show the public the spectacular final test of this test tank being pushed beyond its maximum operating pressure and going out with a big pop. This test campaign is important for Rocket Lab to validate the manufacturing of the second stage carbon fiber tank and structure. And if you think about it, it also kind of gives its teams data to know how to build the tanks for the first stage of Neutron. It's a win-win all around. And speaking of manufacturing rocket hardware, this week Rocket Lab also announced it has finally opened its new engine development center in Long Beach, very close to part of its American headquarters. If you remember, when Virgin Orbit went bankrupt, its main headquarters at Long Beach were sold to Rocket Lab. Well, this is that building. Its new life will be as the manufacturing building for Rocket Lab's Rutherford and Archimedes engines for Electron and Neutron, respectively. We hope that this building has a bit more of a future now than with the last company. A team of researchers using the James Webb Space Telescope has found hundreds of giant errant planets in Orion's nebula. Yeah, that's right, hundreds of Jupiter-sized planets that are not orbiting any star, just wandering around the nebula. This investigation was conducted by Samuel Pearson and Mark McCoffrian from the European Space Research and Technology Center, part of the European Space Agency. Pearson and McCoffrian were investigating the population of what are called errant planets in the Orion Nebula. Now, it's well known through past observations that sometimes during the formation of star systems, either a planet gets flung out of the system due to interactions with other planets, or there's not enough mass in the system to even form a star, so you end up with a brown dwarf if it's too big, or if it's not, then you just get a giant planet wandering around through interstellar space. The Orion Nebula, being a place of high star formation, was an ideal place to look for objects just like these. But what was not clear prior to this investigation is how little mass a planet formed like this can have, especially without a parent star stealing part of the surrounding material. Well, the paper from Pearson and McCoffrian claims to have found 540 potential objects that had the planetary mass of less than 13 Jupiters. What's more, they claim to have found objects with masses as low as 0.6 Jupiter masses, just twice the mass of Saturn. But this goes even beyond that. 9% of these objects are binaries. Yes, giant, errant, Jupiter-sized planets that orbit each other with no parent star. This discovery certainly challenges the current understanding of how star systems form, and will definitely make a ton of astrophysicists have to rethink our models for the formation of stars and planets. I mean, remember all the fights out there about the definition of Pluto and whether it was a dwarf planet or whether it was a normal planet? Well, forget about that. What do you even call a planet that orbits another planet but doesn't really orbit a star? Is it still a planet if it's not orbiting a star? And what about other objects orbiting these binary errant planets? See what I mean? Okay, so maybe not all that chaotic to define these objects, right? But here's the thing. A few days ago, we didn't even have this knowledge. We didn't even know that this was happening pretty much right next door to us. And all of this is possible thanks to the power of the James Webb Space Telescope. Observing and studying these objects is extremely complicated with other telescopes, and if there's anything that Webb is good at, it's rewriting astronomy books. Now let's take a look at this week in launches. A Falcon 9 launch took place this week on September 30th at 2 o'clock UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The rocket was carrying a batch of 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit in support of Starlink's second generation constellation. The booster, B-1069, was flying for a tenth time, marking the 11th booster to reach this milestone. 
The first stage successfully made it down to the deck of SpaceX's drone ship, A Short Fall of Gravitas. This mission marked SpaceX's 10th launch of the month, breaking its own record for most launches in a calendar month and keeping up with the pace of an already record-breaking year. This Chongzheng 2D rocket lifted off on October 5th at 24 past midnight UTC from Launch Complex 3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center in China. It carried a trio of Yaogan 39 military reconnaissance satellites into low Earth orbit. This is now the third launch of a trio of Yaogan 39 satellites and the seventh since July. Another Falcon 9 took off this week on October 5th at 5.36 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. It was also carrying another batch of 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage, B-1076, was flying for an eighth time and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship A Shortfall of Gravitas. With this week's two Starlink missions, SpaceX has now launched a total of 5,222 satellites, of which 358 have re-entered and 4,265 are now in operational orbit. China laid out its solar system exploration plans for the next few decades during the International Astronautical Congress, or IAC, that was held this week in Azerbaijan. The country has various objectives in the next couple of decades that could be split between human exploration and robotic exploration. These can also be split between different destinations, such as the Moon, Mars, other planets, and also the Sun itself. Under its Moon Exploration Program, the country is planning increasingly more complex missions, first robotic, and then including humans as well. In the past decade, we've already seen the launch of the Chang'e 1 to 5 missions, which went from orbiting the Moon to landing on the Moon, the last of which, Chang'e 5, being a sample return mission. The next one in line, Chang'e 6, will also be a sample return mission, but will be landing on the far side of the moon where communications and access are harder. In fact, ahead of this mission, China plans to launch the Chiachao 2 relay satellite, an upgraded version of its Chiachao relay currently located on the Earth-Moon Lagrange point 2. This relay satellite will allow scientists and engineers to be able to monitor their mission's activities while they're on the other side of the moon. Chiachao 2 will launch in March of 2024, and Chang'e 6 will follow two months later in May of 2024. Chang'e 7 and 8 would then follow in 2026 and 2028 to aid the technology development needed for the country's future International Lunar Research Station on the surface of the moon. These missions would serve to prove things like in-situ resource utilization or complex robotic operations that could be of use for this future lunar base. The launches for this lunar base would then start around 2032 and would continue up to 2040. When will we see the Chinese Taikonauts on the moon? Well, the country still says that it's targeting a lunar lander no later than 2030, so we'll have to wait and see if that happens. Now, a lot of these plans have already been known to a certain degree, but until now, the information has been very sparse and in some cases not fully set in stone. Another branch of China's exploration programs involve the exploration of Mars and other planets. The country is planning to launch its Tianwen-2 asteroid sample return mission in 2025, followed by the Tianwen-3 Mars sample return mission in 2028. After that, the Tianwen-4 mission should occur in 2030, launching a probe to Jupiter and potentially to other giant planets in the depths of our solar system. China's exploration program into the 2030s and 2040s becomes even more ambitious, with programs such as the development of an interplanetary relay constellation based on another generation of Chiachao satellites, the construction of a giant interferometer telescope in space to directly observe exoplanets, diverting and controlling the trajectories of test asteroids, all the way up to landing its own Taikonauts on Mars in the 2040s and setting up a Mars base soon after that. These plans will definitely take a lot of money and time to develop. So, as always with spaceflight, we'll have to wait and see what happens, but they could be really promising. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Voyager Space and Northrop Grumman are teaming up for Voyager's Starlab space station. According to the joint press release put out this week, Northrop Grumman will abandon its efforts to build its own space station and will provide cargo services with its Cygnus spacecraft for Starlab. This means that of NASA's Commercial LEO Destinations program, only three projects remain. The one by Axiom Space to assemble a station at the ISS and then disconnect it, this one from Voyager and Northrop, and the Orbital Reef Station by, at least, Blue Origin and Boeing. And I say by at least because this week there were also reports about Sierra Space abandoning the Orbital Reef project. 
While no official information has come through, Blue's website for their station no longer shows Sierra Space nor its Dream Chaser spacecraft. Take that as you will. JAXA's slim lunar lander has left Earth's orbit and is moonbound. In fact, it's already flown by the moon. The spacecraft launched last month on September 7th and, after multiple weeks of orbit-raising maneuvers, completed its translunar injection burn on September 30th at 1740 UTC. By performing this burn, the lander put itself on a course to fly by the moon with the closest approach happening on October 4th at 647 UTC at 4,992 kilometers from the surface of the moon. However, this is just a flyby maneuver and it hasn't entered orbit yet. SLIM used the moon to sling itself much further from Earth, taking what is called a low-energy transfer trajectory to the moon. By taking this much longer route, the spacecraft won't need quite as much propellant as it normally would to arrive there. In its current trajectory, it should enter orbit around the moon sometime in January. This week, Roscosmos released a preliminary failure analysis for its Luna 25 lunar lander that crashed into the south polar regions of the moon back in August. According to the press release, the spacecraft software had set a lower priority value for the lander's accelerometer, meaning that it would not listen to this instrument if other higher priority systems were sending data to the main computer. So, back on August 18th, during a maneuver to lower Luna 25's orbit, the engine started running, but the main computer never got the information that it was indeed moving. It basically thought that the engine wasn't creating any acceleration. The engine continued running for far longer than was needed for the orbit-lowering maneuver, and it ended up stopping after 127 seconds instead of the planned 84 seconds. This longer-than-expected burn put the spacecraft on a collision course with the moon, and it ended up crashing less than an hour after the burn started. This is yet another testament of how important it is for the software to work correctly. You can have the best hardware in the world, but if it doesn't run properly, you might not make it. NASA is about to start the final round of testing for its RS-25E engine, the next generation of the venerable Space Shuttle main engine. During this next set of tests, planned to run into the next year, NASA will be testing engine E0525 under different conditions to confirm that the new and updated manufacturing techniques for the engine work as expected. This will set the stage for Aerojet Rocketdyne to begin full production of this new updated design for the engine set to debut on the SLS rocket for Artemis V. These manufacturing upgrades also allow the engine to run at higher thrust than the older designs that were tailored for the space shuttle. So that'll also give a slight boost to the performance of SLS once it starts using them, even if it may be many years down the line. Stoke Space has announced it has received a new round of funding, bringing in a whopping 100 million US dollars to fully develop its fully reusable rocket and to build up the launch pad for it. By the way, said rocket is not nameless anymore. The company also announced in the same press release that the name of the rocket will be Nova, in a way to pay homage to the previous generations of rocket engineering before it. This week, ESA concluded its review into the failure of Vega C's second stage that occurred back in June of this year while testing corrective actions for a failure that had happened in the second flight of the rocket. One could say this was the failure after the failure. The review determined that the geometry of the throat of the motor and the design of the nozzle and carbon-carbon material caused damage to other parts of the nozzle that led to its complete failure. This is no relation with the failure that happened during the last flight, so this adds on to the list of fixes needed for this stage before Vega C can return to flight. According to ESA, the nozzle will be redesigned to solve this issue and then test it again sometime next year. This will set up Vega C for a return to flight in the fourth quarter of 2024. So, yep, that's more delays for the European Spaceflight Program. Before going into all of the events for next week, here's a quick update on a pair of missions that are set to take place the same day that this video is published. The flight of Virgin Galactic's Galactic 04 mission was delayed from October 5th to October 6th and should be about to take place just a few hours after this video goes live. We also have a launch of an Atlas V rocket with two Kuiper prototype satellites that we'll be covering on our channel live as it happens. We'll obviously take a look back on those on next week's episode, so check back then for a full update on those two flights. And now, let's see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. A Vega rocket, not to be confused with the Vega C, which I mentioned before, is set to take off on October 7th at 1.36 UTC from French Guiana. It's set to carry two main payloads, the Formasat 7R and Theos 2 satellites, plus an additional 10 CubeSats ride-sharing for the flight. 
A pair of Starlink launches are set to take place next week on October 9th. The first one, Starlink Group 622 from Florida, is set to take place within a 4-hour, 30-minute window that will open at 37 minutes past midnight UTC. The second one, Starlink Group 74 from Vandenberg, is set to take place within a 2-hour, 11-minute window that will open at 7.13 UTC. A spacewalk is set to take place next week on the ISS by NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara and ESA astronaut Andreas Mogensen. The pair of astronauts will exit the station to collect samples on the exterior of the orbital complex, replace a high-definition camera, and perform other preparation work for future spacewalks. The start of the roughly six-hour spacewalk is set to take place on October 12th at 1400 UTC. A SpaceX Falcon Heavy is set to launch next week, carrying NASA's Psyche spacecraft into deep space. Liftoff is set for October 12th at 1416 UTC from Launch Complex 39A in Florida. The side boosters will be returning back to the Cape after separating from the center core. NSF will begin live coverage of the launch about 90 minutes before liftoff, so don't forget to like and subscribe and click the notification bell so you can join us when it happens. And that's your weekly update of Spaceflight News! We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.